One of the memoirs of Jesus, you know, your New Testament opens up with four memoirs of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are actual humans who spent time with Jesus and then wrote down their experiences with him. One of those memoirs is unique in the fact that there's actually two parts to it. The book of Luke. Luke is one of the apostles or disciples of Jesus who wrote a memoir about Jesus called Luke. But he also has a second memoir, but it's not about Jesus in the flesh. It's about Jesus in the people. It's about the church. It's called the book of Acts. This is about the beginning of the church, how the church began. And this is the season we're in. We're moving towards the birth of the church together. And where all of this ends up is a group of about 120 people gathered in a home or a house somewhere, waiting for they don't know what. And then there's a sermon where 3,000 people join the movement and the church is born. I've never preached a sermon that good. (laughs) And what I'd like to do today, over the next few weeks, we're going to move towards that moment. We're going to move towards the birth of the church in the story. This story that we started back in November with preparing ourselves for the birth of Jesus, we've been walking with Jesus for all of these months, following along his footsteps all the way to the cross and to resurrection, and then we're approaching the part of the story where it gets turned over to the church, this this historical church that we're still a part of today. And so what I want to do today 
actually is fast forward to the end of the story. Because the next few weeks, we're going to hit on the big parts of the story. And I'll tell you, some of them are a little bit odd. They're a little bit hard to interpret or understand or put ourselves there in this place thousands of years ago. And so today I want to look at the end of the story. So as we journey over the next couple of weeks, you might have some understanding of why things are happening in the way they are. So the story ends, the birth of the church happens in Acts chapter 2. So the next four weeks will all be in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And at the end of Acts chapter 2 is this description of the early church. Can I read it for us today? Acts chapter 2 starting in verse 42. So this is right after Peter preaches this sermon and 3,000 people come to faith. And this is how the earliest community is described. Said the believers, that's the 3,000, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Let's pause there for a second. The apostles' teachings were that simple. It was the apostles telling stories about Jesus. Why? Because they were there, okay? And so as the early church is forming, who better than to tell the stories of Jesus than the humans who spent time with Jesus? The apostles' teachings to the community. This word is a Greek word, koinonia. And koinonia has just this depth of meaning. It would take hours to unpack the full meaning of koinonia. But koinonia is this like, it's this community that has this like sense of care for each other. There's koinonia has this sense of like intimacy and energy within the community. Koinonia has this has this feel of a group of people moving in a direction passionately together. There's this, there's this depth of community called koinonia. To their shared meals, so there's like this hospitality that's happening within the community. And to their prayers, and it's prayers, plural. And likely these prayers would have felt very different than maybe the way we pray today. See, this early community was primarily Jewish. And so the description of the early community is that they're having these experiences, but they're still practicing their Jewish prayers. So they had this rhythm of prayer in their community. They'd have morning prayers and certain prayers they'd say around the dinner table and certain prayers they'd say at night and certain prayers they'd say in different seasons. There was like this rhythm of prayer that the community kept to. And the next sentence says, and there's a sense of awe. That came over everyone. So emerging from this community life, emerging from this life they're sharing together, is this sense of awe. And then this is the fun part. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate together in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. And the Lord added to the community daily those who were being saved. I mean, is that not a compelling picture of community? I mean, if you heard about this happening like an hour down the road, would you go visit? I would. Would you call someone you know that's a part of it? Be like, hey, can you tell me about this? These are the things I'm hearing about your community. Is this true? Is it this vibrant that every day people are being added to the community? Are people really selling possessions to take care of one another? And it just emerged from what seems like this really simple practice of faith. Wouldn't you want to know? Wouldn't that be compelling to you? Man, this last sentence gets me every time. The Lord added to the community daily those who were being saved. So that word saved is, um, is, a, is a particular word. It's the word sozo. In the Greek, it's the word sozo. And in the New Testament, this word sozo appears 106 times through the New Testament. Do you think it's an important word for the early church? It certainly is. It certainly is. But this word sozo has, has like koinonia, has this depth of meaning that I think sometimes gets lost in English. So I wanted to bring us through just all the different ways that this is experienced among God's people, the ways that this is described in the way in life of Jesus. The first time we see this word sozo in the New Testament goes all the way back to the birth of Jesus. See, Joseph and Mary, these are Jesus' bio parents. 
They're, they're betrothed to be married, which is like they're engaged. or it, it Actually, it was probably more of an arranged marriage. It was arranged that eventually Joseph and Mary would come together. And Mary gets pregnant and says to Joseph, I promise I haven't had sex with anyone. Joseph is like, okay. How, how's that work, right? And so Joseph is deciding, right? Like, am I going to stay with her? Right? Am I going to stick this out? This is kind of embarrassing. This is going to be hard for me to work through. And Joseph, in a dream, hears from an angel. This is what the angel says. The Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus because he will save Sozo, his people, from their sins. Now, if you've been tracking with the story, God's people have had this kind of up and down relationship with God, right? There are times when they've needed rescue and they've cried out to God and God rescues them. But then there are times when they're in power and they leave God. They stop, they stop living into the things that God has called and created them to be. And they find themselves you know, in oppression once again, and then God calls them out, and they get rescued. And so there's this up and down reality of that God's people have been going through this thousands of years of self-destruction. And so when the angel says to Joseph that Jesus will save them from their sins, save them, sozo, is this salvation or this rescue from self-destruction. It's, uh, it's, it's in the story of Jesus. One day that Jesus is uh, on a boat with his disciples, and there's these waves. It's like everywhere. It's this huge storm. And the disciples are petrified. They think they're going to die. This is how this story goes in the book of Matthew. When Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A huge storm arose in the lake. So the waves were sloshing over the side of the boat. But Jesus was asleep. They came and woke him, saying, Lord, rescue us. Sozo, Lord, sozo us, we're going to drown. At times, people's experience of salvation feels like this rescue from harm. Have you been there? Perhaps you've heard the story of the woman who pressed through the crowd to touch the garment, Jesus' garment. See, this woman has this disease that... Keeps her separate from society. This is how this story goes. A woman who had been bleeding for 12 years came up from behind Jesus and touched the hem of his clothes. She thought, if I only touch his robe, I'll be healed. So, so. When Jesus turned and saw her, he said, be encouraged, daughter, your faith has healed you. There's Sozo again. And the woman was healed from that time on. There's Sozo again. A more literal translation, or maybe some would say a better translation of healed would be to be made well. That sozo had in some people's lives has this implication of being made well. One day Jesus was teaching on this idea of sozo. And this is what he said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives, sozo. All who want to sozo their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? See, when Jesus teaches about salvation, about sozo, in this setting, he, he paints this picture of like self-reliance versus self-sacrifice. That Jesus is saying that the true way to so-so is exemplified in the cross. In giving up your life for others. Not trying to preserve your own life. Nicodemus is somebody in the scriptures that has this kind of ongoing conversation with Jesus. Nicodemus was like a religious teacher of the day. And Nicodemus is responsible for spurring on Jesus' perhaps most famous words found in John 3.16. Anybody know this passage? Anybody know Austin 3.16? Got a couple. All right. I tried that last service. I tried it again today. A good joke. 
is worth driving home. Okay. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So everyone who believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. And then it goes on. God didn't send his son to the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved. So, so, through him. See, in this setting, as Jesus is talking about salvation, he's pairing up two ideas. You can live in response to mortality, or you can live in response to eternity. It's this idea that we've been born once makes sense in the life we live, right? We all know that at one point or another, everyone in this room was born. You don't remember it, but it happened. But then Jesus says, as you move your life from being focused on mortality to focused on eternity, there is an experience that is like, I don't know, being born again. It's like a whole new life in front of you, Nicodemus, when you change your perspective to eternity. Jesus, in another time, was teaching in Jerusalem as things were getting very contentious and heated around his life and ministry. And he says this, whoever believes in me doesn't believe in me, but the one who sent me. Whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me won't live in darkness. If people hear my words and don't keep them, I don't judge them. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. So, so. So in this teaching, Jesus is using this word so, so as this idea of safety from judgment or this idea of dark and light, that, that, that pre-salvation, pre-Jesus, maybe you feel like you've been in darkness and through Jesus, the world seems like it's full of light. So, so. And then this word was so important to the way of Jesus that it's actually the word that people use to mock Jesus on the day of his murder. This is what the guards screamed out to Jesus on the cross. Save yourself. Come down from that cross. So, so. In the same way, the chief of priests were making fun of him among themselves together with the legal experts. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He sozoed others, they said, but he can't sozo himself. And then even in this moment, man, they don't get it. That salvation in the way of Jesus is not something we do for ourselves. That it's not something that we do. We have the ability within us to experience all alone. But the way of Jesus is about looking to Jesus for so-so. And I just think in a community like ours, actually I know because I've started to hear some stories, but some of you have experienced salvation from a world that was moving in the direction of complete self-destruction. Some of us in this room have experienced salvation in a way that has felt like a rescue, like our whole life was going nowhere good fast, and Jesus rescued you from that. Some of us have experienced salvation in a concept that feels like I'm, I, was, I was not well, and now I'm being made well. Some of you have experienced the salvation of Jesus, of of moving from a life that was completely self-reliant and realizing that self-reliance isn't all it's made up to be. And Jesus has saved you from the life obsessed with self-reliance. Some of you have experienced salvation in a concept that feels like you've been born again. I can tell you when my family came to faith, man, it sure felt like we were born again, like we got a hold new life. And some of you have experienced salvation as a, an awakening to the light, that your life felt like this weight of darkness. And salvation has opened up your eyes to what God is doing in the world. 
And some of you have experienced salvation and under the weight of judgment. Where you've walked through life feeling this weight of judgment on your shoulders. And in the story of Jesus, in relationship to Jesus, and in crying out to Jesus, you've experienced salvation as that judgment has been lifted off your life. So-so. And I think sometimes this language, like the word saved, becomes this like theological conversation. Sozo is a verb. It's an experience. And in a community like this, many of us, just like the stories of Scripture, have experienced salvation in so many different ways through the same person of Jesus. We've been moving through this story since November, but more recently we moved through Good Friday. And Good Friday invites us to ask, where am I seeking resurrection? And then Easter Sunday invites us to ask, where am I seeing resurrection? And I think this season of the church we're in, as we move towards the birth of the church, as we move towards Pentecost, this season invites us to ask, what kind of community does God want? What kind of community does God want? You know, I think if you carry these three questions with you on the journey, if we as a community just carried these three questions with us in life, I think we would discover something powerful in our midst. If we wake up every day and think about where might I be seeking resurrection? Where might I need to experience the resurrection power of Jesus? And then we open our eyes to look around and say, where might I be seeing resurrection? Where might this be going on all around me? And as we sit in those questions to ponder what kind of community does Jesus want? These three questions guide the way I think about leading our church. It's not about what I want. We're about what you want. It's about seeking resurrection in our lives. It's about seeing resurrection in our lives. And it's about contemplating and asking God to reveal what kind of community is it that you want. What does this look like in response to all of it? And I think that's what this text is trying to do. The community that emerges, that organically just comes in this moment, this description of community pushes us to wrestle with this question, what kind of community does God want? Let me read this description to us again. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostle. All the believers, <coughs> sorry, all the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. It was this community that was so compelling that saw this church just explode. A community and a way of life that became so compelling that it didn't just stay in that place, but began expansion around the entire globe. You know what's compelling about the church historically is not how well we can articulate our theology. It's not how good our music is or what color the carpet is or how articulate the pastor is. What is compelling about the church through history was how they experience salvation in their midst as a present reality, as people's lives actually being changed. 
Theological categories are helpful when we talk about the church. They're not helpful to place on people's lives. That we experience God among us. And that's what's compelling to the world around us. You know, there was a time. There was a time that in a place like Michigan, a good, you know, Midwest state, where if you did church the right way, if the kids' ministry was awesome and you got greeters in the parking lot shaking hands and smiling faces and the music was good and the preaching was good, your church would grow. I can show you. You can look. Data, it's X plus Y equals Z. The ROI was clear. That's not been true around the globe, but it was true here for a season. Friends, that season is going away. It doesn't exist in the morality of people's brains when they're going through difficult seasons. Maybe the church has something good to say about this. We blew that one long ago. But you know what will always be compelling about the church? The thing that's always been compelling about the church. The power of God changing people's lives. Sozo. Sozo. Opening ourselves up to transformation in the way of Jesus. This week, as I reflected on this and wrestled with this, I was like, how could we get our heads and hearts around this? So I wrote a paraphrase of this text for us. That if someone was writing about, if we experience Pentecost, how would this text be written for us? I call it a paraphrase so no one can accuse me of being a heretic. Those Christians in Jackson are so committed to learning about Jesus and caring for each other. I mean, they do all the regular church things like praying and singing. But there seems to be something more than just the usual Christian stuff happening. These people, they, they share everything. It's like they've lost all interest in self-preservation. I heard some of them are even selling their stuff because there are so many people who have basic, tangible needs hanging around them. It's really amazing. People you thought could never change are changing. People with really challenging circumstances are finding hope. People who couldn't be more different from each other are eating together in each other's homes. These stories are bananas. It's starting to feel like they're everywhere. They gather together at their church and in their homes. They don't really care where they are. They just find ways to get together, eat, and celebrate their friend Jesus. It's all so simple, hospitable, and generous. I think it's becoming a good thing for our community. Every day I hear of more people joining in and being changed. May it be so. May it be so.